Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Erica Hall. Erica is the co-founder of Mule Design, based in San Francisco, and the author of Just Enough Research and Conversational Design. And I am a huge fan of Erica's work, so it is great to have her with us on Cool Tools. How are you doing, Erica? Hi, it's a it's great to be here. You know, I'm I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm really yeah. looking forward to hearing um, your suggestions, and I'm sorry that we can't meet face to face. But this is the time when we um, do everything virtually, I guess. It's true. It's true. And I'm you know I've been uh, doing so much more remotely over the last year, so I feel I feel really prepared for this. Yeah, that's good. So do you typically work from home rather than at the mule headquarters? Uh, I still, I still typically, well, I've, I've, I've been at home now, but I've been splitting my time because even though I, I do so much, uh, remote work and remote consulting, we have a really nice, uh, setup there. You know, we've got like our, our podcast studio there and our mm-hmm. sort of remote, meeting room there and I have many fantastic backdrops like real physical photo backdrops with Godzilla and dinosaurs so that's so cool yeah really wow. great do you do a lot of client meetings there or is it more just the great tools that you have there um it's it's some client meetings but even uh we've always had a lot of clients uh all over the place and so mm-hmm. most of our work has been remote. So the people we work together in the office, but then our clients are often remote. And so sometimes they'll, they'll come over, but it's been since so many teams are distributed or semi distributed anyway. Uh, it's, it's really worked out, but we have an art gallery and we've had a lot of in person events in the space and community events and workshops. We do a lot of workshops in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now. We're just moving. It's like we're just switching the proportions of what we do. So instead of doing, you know, some in-house or on-site activities in the studio space, it's now, well, we're doing all those things uh, remotely, but it's not that hard of a switch because we were already doing uh, a, a lot of stuff. But I just need I need to bring my Godzilla backdrop home <laughs> I think is, uh, is, is what I've got to do. Right. That's yeah. great. <laughs> so, Erica, let's let's start talking about the tools. Yeah. The first one is mm-hmm. uh, is a classic one: three by five cards. Tell us why mm. you like them and and why you think they're better <laughs> than post it notes. Oh yeah. So this is really I I literally do like trail these behind me sometimes. And when I I travel to a a workshop or a conference or a client meeting on an airplane, frequently I'm I'm organizing my work and like just just spreading them all all over the place uh little trail of cards uh it's just because they're um inexpensive you can find them everywhere you can use them on horizontal surfaces like i'm i'm really i think they're better for collaboration with everybody kind of gathering around a desk and Mm -hmm. you can organize them and reorganize them and you can save them you can do the weird merlin man thing and like bundle a bunch up with a little uh you know Binder office clip. clip yeah a little binder a little binder clip um and i find that they're fantastic for just for organizing complex thoughts because a lot of times my work is either you know i'm i'm working on helping a client with a a design system or to organize some concepts or you know to write a book or an article and you can take notes on them uh, and then you can save them and carry them and reorganize them and constantly recombine them. And they're a lot sturdier than a, a post-it note. And, and, and mm-hmm. you can like hand them around. Uh, and so they're just, you know, I was, I was trying to think of when we were talking about this podcast of, of what the essential tool is. I'm like, well, it's not, it's really kind of basic but as far as like organizing my thoughts because you know sometimes i i have all these ideas in my head right and they're all floating around and oh how do i organize these into something that makes sense physically 
putting them down, putting ideas down or quotes down, and then uh, organizing them like, uh, you know, like a deck of cards or something really, it really helps because you can pick it up and look at it and hand it to somebody else. Um, yeah. And, and so that, and it makes it, it just makes it feel more fun, but I don't go mm-hmm. all the way to the, cause I know there are the blank uh, sets of cards that are cool. And I've talked to people who really like to use those like playing cards, like it's like a game, but mm-hmm. I feel like you can get more precious about those just because they're a bit harder to find, a bit more expensive. It feels more like, oh, if I write something down on a card, it's got to be cool or good or like yeah. a Brian Eno level thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like the, my problem with moleskines too. I I yeah. feel like, you know, really do I want to like sully this book with my <laughs> scrawls? And so I, mm-hmm. I get these Muji notepad things that are like, I don't know, like 200 pages and it's, they're like 84 yen. I, I pick them up whenever I go to Narita airport, I get like 20 of them and stuff my suitcase. And then it's like just a newsprint pad. I feel so much better. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can, and you can pin, uh, uh, three by five cards on, a, you know, a wall or you can use magnets on a, on a wall. So, so you can make them vertical if you want as well. Mm-hmm. And bookmarks. Um, you, and it's just, yeah, I love them. Do you use yeah. lined or unlined? Uh, I, I like, I mean, I like the blank ones a lot. It kind of depends. I usually have both kinds around. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Cause if I'm just, if I'm taking notes, if I'm reading a book, I just, I always read a book with a stack of lined three by five cards so I can write down quotes or something like that. Cause often I'm, I'm reading for something I can use later. And, and if I'm just, uh, doing some design work, I kind of prefer the blank ones. And sometimes they come in colors. You know, you can get real fancy with them. Mm-hmm. I use them in my workshops. Yeah. I feel like post-its are the real cliche and not post. Yeah. Post-its are the real cliche, but, uh, but it's hard to actually do things on a wall. And a lot of people don't have a lot of vertical wall space yeah. anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're right. It is hard to do things on the wall. It's like, more than two people, then somebody is really like blocking everything, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And if it's on a table, especially like a, a large circular table, everyone has equal access to them. Right? It's like yeah. King Arthur and the round table. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's good. That's okay. Cool. So those three by five cards, that's that's a good one. Um, the next one is uh, a, a tool that helps you uh, with your relationship with your, your weird little dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it's my weird little dog. Rupert is, is very important. Uh, and most of my Instagram is photos of, of my weird little dog, but I'm, uh, I, I bike places. I, I really love to bike and I don't have a car. That's really how I get around. And so when I do go into the studio, uh, I take, Rupert with me and I take him in a bike trailer that attaches uh, to the back of my bike. But you can put all kinds of things in the trailer besides a dog. Yeah. If you you didn't have a cute, weird dog, you could put a kid in there or Uh, uh, groceries. Yeah. It's dog specific. Okay. It is a dog specific bike trailer. And, uh, but I can't, I have used it for other things. It's really handy. And sometimes uh, if I'm biking past uh, Trader Joe's on the way home, uh, Rupert now knows. Like, if I if I stop at a store, he'll scoot over to the side because he'll know that like a a bag is going right. in. There's like a little sunroof kind of deal, and I can pop the bag down in there with right. him. Or if I have to run an errand uh, and I want to get more groceries, I can also put groceries and no dog in there. So, so to describe the thing, it's sort of like um, a, like a tent-ish kind of material, including a screen material that goes around like a, I don't know, a large suitcase size container that's on two small wheels, and then there's um, a metal hitch that it pulls along. Yeah. Yep, there's the, the metal arm that attaches to the back wheel, and it comes on and off really easily. So there's the arm that attaches to the trailer. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just on two wheels. Uh, it has a little plastic rain flap that goes over it, uh, which is really helpful because Rupert hates the rain. 
and it has a flagpole. And from my flagpole, I fly my Ruth Bader Ginsburg pennant. So that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> and that flagpole so cool. is, is that for visibility? Yes, yes, because it, the traffic in San Francisco has gotten really, really intense, and it's it's pretty low to the ground. Like the trailer right. itself is orange. Like I had a red one. The one I have now is orange. And, uh, it's, it's just a couple feet off the ground and I ride down Market Street in, in traffic and then I go up Grant Street and, uh, there's tour buses and just a lot of kind of mayhem. And mm-hmm. so I feel a lot better if there's the tall flagpole with the orange flag and Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, you know, the reflective stickers on it. Sometimes I add lights when it's, mm-hmm. uh, winter time and there's not as much daylight. Right. That's it's got really a little cool. pad inside, little cushion uh, for the dog, little front zip door. Uh, he hops right in. Uh-huh. Yeah. Cool. Did it take him a while to get used to it, or was he like right away thinking this was super cool? It took about a week. Like at first, when I first got him, and I was first because I got the trailer right away because I knew this was the vision for my lifestyle. Like <laughs> I'm a person who bikes to work with my towing my dog. And so it's also very good for fitness because I bike up and down hills with like what 25 pounds of trailer and 25 pounds of dog behind me. And I just put treats in there. It took him about a week. He cried a little bit in the beginning, but then he got used to it. And I think he actually, uh, he actually kind of enjoys it. You know, as long as there's not too much rain or, or too much scary traffic. And, and like, um, to park the bike, do you, do you, um, have to disassemble it to park it? Do you park it separately? Do you, um, h- how does that work? Uh, usually, uh, in our old office, it was a whole thing because the elevator was out for a while and I had to disassemble it and carry first mm. the bike and the dog up the stairs and then the trailer. And the trailer doesn't weigh too much. It's just a little awkward. But um, usually, I, I leave it all attached. And I'm lucky mm. enough to have bike storage where I can just roll it in on the first mm. floor and it's it's a first floor both places situation and it's fine i i lock up the bike but if i have the trailer i don't usually bother locking the trailer cuz the whole thing is so weird i just feel that if a bike thief like i've had many bikes stolen in san francisco and i i feel like a thief just sees this it's like a parade float <laughs> they will just see this thing and think you know what that's that's not my easy target. I, yeah, I right. don't even know what to do with that. <laughs> All right. So, and it's about two hundred bucks. Looks like. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I had a very similar looking trailer for my daughter that I used to when I used to mm. bike her to uh, preschool many years ago. She really liked it. Yeah, it's pre- it's pretty similar. I think that yeah, the one for kids has like a little seat and a seat belt, and it's funny. Some people will approach and and peer in to, to go. Oh, is is that a dog or a child? And there, there'll be a little <laughs> mystery <laughs> as they approach. <laughs> and and I feel I really entertain the tourists. You know, I ride through a lot of touristy areas, and people who are from cities where maybe commuting by bike uh, with your dog is not common. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I get a, I get a lot of comments. So I feel like I'm also representing uh, the city of San Francisco to tourists. Yeah, that's cool. You should put a little tip jar on the side of that. Yeah, or, or <laughs> yes. start offering t- g- t- tour guides, little tours. Yeah. Uh, Very cool. Funny. So so what do you have next on your list here, Erica? Let's see a a Roxanne magnet coffee filter holder. That sounds super specialized. <laughs> it is so specialized. <laughs> and and here's an, another way I might be a, a, a cliche or a type is being that person, that American who went to Japan <laughs> and found this really intensely cool object. This is probably the best designed object I, I've ever encountered in my life because we have... Uh, you know, everybody has their coffee making philosophy, strategy, technique, what have you with the weighing or the grinding or whatever. We just have, we have a nice drip coffee maker, uh, a Technivore Mocha Master, which I, if you like drip coffee, I, it makes the best coffee, but mm-hmm. we keep it under, on our counter, underneath our cabinets and our cabinets are metal. And 
because of the configuration of our kitchen, there was like no really good place to keep the filters. And every place we put them felt really disorganized and out of place. Like we'd have it, the, the filter bag, we'd keep a couple on the counter or we'd have it tucked away somewhere else. And this was actually a situation that created a certain amount of, you know, that that angst of having like one type of thing just out of place with no home. Mm-hmm. Having a big bag of coffee filters was a, like a problem because we drink a lot of coffee. Mm-hmm. And so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I went to Japan for a conference and I was walking around just going in the, the little stores and I randomly walked into uh, a little boutique that had clothing and a little jewelry and like a little accessories and a few little home goods. And sitting there on the table was a piece of wood. It's just like an open, like a, a trapezoid, I guess the shape would be, mm-hmm. of of wood. Um, and it was labeled like coffee filter holder, magnetic coffee filter holder. So it- Like it was um, made for you. Like it was made for me. I, I freaked. I lo- I just lost it. I was like, this solves this intensely highly specific problem. And it's so elegant. It, it has no visible magnet. It just, it looks like it's just this hollow, uh, trapezoid or is it a trapezoid? It well, shape? It, yeah. So, so it's sort of like a long piece of wood and there's a slot in it. And the slot is trapezoid shape, meaning that it narrows. Yeah. The slot narrows yeah. as it goes down the wood. And the wood's only maybe a half inch or something thick. Um, and so there's this kind of trapezoid slot in it, in a, in a long stick yeah. of a wood. Yeah. And it's, it's perfectly designed for somebody who has a drip coffee maker because it's made to hold those uh, cone-shaped filters. Who and keeps it under metal cabinets on a counter. Like it solved my precise situation. It was twelve dollars, and wow. it also has the number sixty three on it and uh, embossed on it. And I didn't know what this was for a long time until I was trying to describe this object to someone else. Like this is the most specifically designed, <laughs> amazing object. If you have metal cabinets and you keep your coffee maker under them. And I finally looked it up online and the number 63 is apparently uh, just for numerological purposes. Like it's a, mm-hmm. a lucky number that represents, I forget that the exact explanation, like uh, male, female, harmony stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's a very simple, <laughs> the simple wooden object, no visible magnets and the number 63, which adds a little bit of mystery to it. And That's so cool. I, yeah, I, it just, I love that so there's no weird. other branding on it besides that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I never, and I, how, and just the fact that I needed this thing and it, you know, it was like something out of a Miyazaki movie. Like I went yeah. into the forest. <laughs> it and, totally is. Right, right. I and love I found it. this magical object and, and it's just every day when I make coffee in the morning, it brings me joy because right. the filters are very tidy right above the coffee maker in such a convenient place. And right. Uh, yeah, I love it. So it's one of my most beloved objects. So uh, cool. And yeah. it says it can hold 30 pieces of filter. Yeah. So that's quite a, that's a month, at least a month's worth. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, that's like <laughs> a week in my house. <laughs> a week in my house. And I love the explanation on the, on the website where it's like that you feel the warmth of the tree. Like it, it's very simple. It dispenses paper filters and then it has the warmth of the tree. Um, and so it has this really beautiful kind of organic feel. So it's just, there's probably a word for something like this that's just so simple and so perfect and so, so intensely highly specific. That's so cool. Good, good, great pick. Um, so we've got a, Book? Book. Is that right? Yeah, Im- implementing book. value pricing? Yeah. Ultimate value pricing. Yeah, After, going in a yeah. totally different direction. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Um, a radical model. I can feel radical the warmth of the tree in this one. <laughs> the, the warmth of the, the paper yeah. the, that you'll, you'll be yeah, collecting. Right. So, so, so what, what excites you about implementing value pricing? <laughs> I know it. This is such a turn. It's like I hang out with my dog. I make some coffee. <laughs> I have my little simple cards, and then I implement some value pricing. 
So, uh, you know, so I've had a design agency. I've been in the services business a very, very long time. And one of the things I work with clients on often is their pricing strategy. Like generally, if you're doing something online, you're hoping to, uh, you know, either make money if you're a for-profit company or, you know, raise money if you're a, a nonprofit organization. And, and there's so much, uh, angst around this, right? Like, oh, what do I charge uh, people? How do I make sure that I make enough money to either support my mission or to make my organization profitable? And people, and and if you're a designer, like designers are already so often like kind of low self-esteem and freaked out anyway. And designers are so worried about what to charge clients. And and so, uh, but it's it's a good and functional thing in society if people charge an appropriate price for something so that other people uh, pay it and then get something that's valuable to them. Like mm-hmm. that sort of transactional relationship is is, it, is kind of the basis of a, a lot of society is trade and charging a price. <laughs> so right. um, why I really I, I like this book is that his, uh, his model, uh, he's a, you know, an author and a, and a consultant, uh, Ronald J. Baker, is, uh, is to help get people away from the hourly model. And if you think about mm. it, so, so much of, well, it's, it's like, even if you're salaried, you'll have a sense of like, oh, this is how much I make per time period. And, uh, you know, if people are like buying design services, a lot of times they'll say, oh, what do you, what do you charge per hour? What's your rate? And that, doesn't make sense in a lot of cases. Like you're valuing the wrong thing because it, you don't care. Like really, you don't care how much time somebody spends on something. You care about the outcome. But for mm-hmm. whatever reason, it's really uncomfortable to say, Oh, you're just gonna like, as a say, as a designer, I'm, you know, I'm going to charge you a hundred thousand dollars for an outcome. Like a lot of designers are so uncomfortable if they can't back that up with detail about every single way they're going to be spending their time. But that mm-hmm. makes no sense because the client doesn't benefit from you spending time. The client benefits from like you achieving something. And if you achieve something really valuable faster, everybody's happy. But right. if, you're char- if you're charging hourly, you lose. Yeah, that's so mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah, because everyone wants something that is high quality and fast. Yeah. And so you should expect to pay more for that rather than like saying, well, look how many hours this took me to do. Yeah. Like I should get more. So, right? so does, does this book suggest alternative ways to determine what that price should be? Yeah. And that's where the, the value comes in because his mission in writing this book is to move the business model from I'm selling you my time to I'm selling like he calls it intellectual capital, but it's essentially I'm, I'm selling you something of value and, and I want to, and I'm going to be thinking about ways not to to charge, not to spend more time, but to create more value. And this, this really helps uh, people who are selling services uh, better value their own time. So they're not just like killing themselves to make money. And it also helps you think, well, how do I give you something that really makes you feel great that you paid this much money? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but it, but it is kind of a, it's uncomfortable because we have this like sense of, Oh, there should be an hourly rate, but mm-hmm. why? Mm-hmm. And so he, in the book, he talks about ways to think about value by, you know, um, creating something that, that people really want. And, um, and how to how to implement it and how to think about it in terms of like getting a fair share so nobody's feeling exploited. And the reason I recommend this this particular book to everybody, like it looks, if you look at the cover, it's like uh, it looks like a horrible purple textbook. It's kind of priced <laughs> like a textbook. Yeah, it doesn't have one it of is. those like fun like 
cool. I'm a cool business <laughs> design person cover. It just, it smells like accounting when you look at it, right? It's like yeah, orange really and does. purple. Yeah. It has a little arrow and it says website in, like yeah. included on it. So it looks like it's from the nineties and so much. set all that aside because yeah, it just, it, it, this is why I wanted to, to include it. Because it's so useful and you wouldn't know it's the opposite of that elegant little coffee filter holder. Because you look at it and you think, oh, this is going to be boring and um, and unhelpful and really dry and not really practical. But he's a really like the writing is actually fun and witty. And if you're interested in running an ethical business, like I think this this book is useful to Anybody, even if you don't necessarily think of yourselves as being in a services business, or even if you're just trying to price a thing to sell, this really helps you think about what is really the value of mm -hmm. what I'm selling and how do I make sure that I provide the most value to the person who's my user, my customer, my client, whatever, and get the most for myself in a way that is, it's like adding something good to the world. It's not, oh, how do I extract the most mm -hmm. from somebody but it's like how do i both deliver something that's like really great and useful and 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 get what i need to like live and thrive and and be profitable mm -hmm. uh and it's it's a topic that a lot of people avoid because we have so much discomfort talking about money and this is a way to think about it that's really humanistic right it's about cuz like our time is like our our most precious resource and if if we think that the only way that we can like make a living in the world is by giving our time to somebody else as opposed to flipping the equation around and saying okay how do i uh like make as much money as i want to make and um and add something really useful to the world but make sure that um th you know that i'm not just on the hook for spending time unnecessarily so it's a way of doing more creative problem solving. Does he yeah. does he address the the issue of zero price of um, premium and premium and giving things away? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I think his um, part part of what he he talks about is like not giving stuff away. Um, uh, he yeah it, he 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 does kind of address those things. He 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 actually talks about businesses that charge admission. Um, and thinking about yourself like that, as opposed to always thinking like, "Oh, I have to give something away." Mm -hmm. So I think I think that's one of the things that's radical about it. And he talks about the fact that he uses the word "radical" to mean getting to the root, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to doing something like really wacky. Right. Right. He's right. like, "Why don't give away value that that you don't have to?" Like, so so for anybody who's thinking like, "Oh, I've got to do work for free." Uh, and that's a lot of designers, a lot mm -hmm. of writers, a lot of uh, just a lot of creative professionals have been have absorbed this idea that in order to eventually make money for your work, you just have to do free work. And and so I'd encourage everybody to read this, to really think, to make sure that you're getting what you, uh, you know, what you need and. Uh, and what will help you thrive while at the same time solving the right problem and not just doing things in a way that you think is the right way or doing things in a way that you think is comfortable. Cool. Really good. Really good. I have to check it out because you're right. The cover, the cover screams, do not pick me up. Um, it's but, horrible. <laughs> but, so, so yeah, but um, with your recommendation, I'm now very interested in this idea of um, how you, uh, I mean, he's not just talking about how you make a price to the value, but how you can actually see or perceive or articulate your value. Exactly. Exactly. And it really gets, it does get into very uh, uh, operational terms about like, here's how to project manage and here's, um, you know, here's how to, you know, come up with right. the payment terms and things like that. Here's how to terminate. But anybody who does, anything where they're involved in uh, creating or setting a price, I would say it would benefit from this. And the writing is really good. Like really, it's just that cover. 
the cover just. <laughs> yeah. so. I think you should use what you learned from the book and then offer to refactor the cover. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. For the author. Exactly. Yeah. Well, this has been so helpful. In fact, you've been so helpful to us. You should be charging us. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. Um, but, but before we we jump off, tell us about the uh, second edition of your book, Just Enough Research. Oh, sure thing. So back, like way back in 2013, which now seems like a, a millennium ago, uh, I wrote a really short book about design research because uh, I was in the position of uh, trying to convince uh, clients that research, like understanding the problem was not an optional part of the work that you do need to not only understand your customers and how they live their lives. You need to understand your own business, which is the part that people forget about a lot to really be clear about what their goals or capacity or capabilities are. You need to understand the world in order to solve a problem uh, that exists in the world. Uh, so I wrote this little orange book and then uh, people seemed to like it and years passed and I thought, oh, well, I should revise it so that um, people feel comfortable recommending a book that's new again and go through the whole thing to make sure it's really up to date. And I added a chapter on surveys, which I'd left out of the first version because I think surveys are really advanced and nobody should be running surveys who doesn't have a master's degree. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, like here's a case where the tools are kind of a problem because the tools for creating surveys are so easy to use now. Like it used to be, it, it wasn't that easy to just all of a sudden survey a thousand, 10,000 people. But now the tools are really good. And that makes people think that running a survey is actually really easy. But designing a survey is really hard to do it right. And so I, I wrote a whole chapter uh, and going in depth about the pitfalls and what to think about so that you don't use a very easy tool to get some garbage data that mm -hmm. will then lead you to make a really bad decision, which happens so Are you a lot. thinking of like SurveyMonkey or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but even even Google Forms and things like mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. that, yeah, there's so many so many tools and and the, when you use a tool that makes something easy it makes you think that you're really good at it <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly that's very yeah. true uh and besides the fact that you added the survey chap chapter was there anything else you changed your mind about in the between the first and second edition mm -hmm. that's a great question um I, what a, the thing I, I probably changed my mind about the most uh but it didn't necessarily really affect too much is that I I don't like to talk about research as much anymore because that makes it sound like it's a separate thing and it makes it sound like you're doing academic research as opposed to getting the information you need to make design or product or business decisions. Uh, I've been thinking like evidence-based design is better. So I talk about like that a little bit. But other than that, when I read through it, I was actually like, I felt, I felt pretty good about it. Like I, like because I was really talking about the fundamental principles, because I think in order to use any method or use any technique or use any research tool, you need to just fundamentally know what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. and then you can, and then you can choose, right? If you know, if you can do research with a pencil and paper, and you know what you're doing, then you can decide, oh, this is the, this is the technique or tool that will help me do the thing I'm already doing right more effectively, but no like research method, uh, on its own will get you better information. And so I feel because I had that emphasis on critical thinking and forming good questions and collaborating as opposed to anything that was very, uh, timely or ephemeral i feel like a lot of it really really held up well that's really great i'm um looking forward to reading this one too this cover is a lot better so uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is <laughs> it's just orange yes it's just orange i had a whole discussion with the, the publisher of course because uh, you know a book apart uh when they first started publishing books i think they imagined a much more limited series 
And, and so the cover design system was, it'll be a color with some text on it. And by the time it got to Just Enough Research, which was number nine, they'd kind of run through the rainbow. And they tried to talk me into a, a warm sand color. And I said, no. I said, it's got to be orange because people already have sad feelings about research. And so it has <laughs> to be a fun color. And it has to be something where you see uh, my book on somebody's desk across the room. Or if you're buying it online, like they sell the books online, it has to look good online. And I feel so good about that choice because when you see if you're shopping online or you, or somebody does a roundup of all my favorite like UX books or research books or something, you can pick just enough research like out of a pile of recommended books, like from far away. It totally passes the squint test. And so uh, I'm, I'm really happy with that. Yeah. It looks great. It be. The only yeah. thing is it's missing is a, Website. <laughs> <laughs> website included. Yeah. yeah, website yeah. Included. It needs yeah. that little arrow. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, okay. Erica, this has been so much fun talking with you and learning about a, a very wide variety of tools that yes, I haven't please. really heard of anything, uh, of any of them, except the three by five cards. <laughs> yeah. But it was great hearing how you use them too. And, and, I love re reconsidering all tools uh, mm -hmm. and thinking about them again. Yeah. And thanks for the great book tips as well. They're really great. Oh, oh, super. I really like this is, yeah, I want everybody to not be afraid of of asking hard questions and and talking about what things are really worth, you know. Sure. That, that, yep. That's my thing. Very cool. Thank well, thanks again, Eric. I really appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation. And uh, yeah, stay safe out there. Hey, everybody. It's your host, Mark. And I wanted to thank you for listening to the Cool Tools show. And I also wanted to let you know that we've got a lot more going on at Cool Tools than just this podcast. We also have the Cool Tools website, which has a new tool review every day. And you can get there by going to cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters that you can subscribe to, and you can subscribe to those from the Cool Tools page. We have this podcast that you're listening to right now. We also have a YouTube channel where we review tools. Check that YouTube channel out by going to youtube.com slash cool tools. And one of the things I'd like to ask you is if you're really enjoying everything that we are producing, go to our Patreon page and support us there. You can sign up and give us as little as $1 a month, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that we get from Patreon goes towards a lot of things. We transcribe our podcast interviews so that you can read them online. We pay for editing of our podcasts and for our videos. We pay our contributors. We have video production costs. We have equipment costs. We have hosting costs. And the money you give us through Patreon also goes to support Cool Tools Lab. Anything you give is a huge help. And one of the things that we do is if you are a contributor to Patreon, we'll give you a shout out on air. And so I have a few people here to thank this week. Mark Lyonage, Micah Gates, Monty Zukowski, Patrick James McNally, Robert Cohen, Scott, Spence Lloyd, Steve Avery, Steve Golden, Steve Levine, Tom Hess, William Phillips, Aaron Nipper, Darab Patel, Glenn Mercer, Jay Walker, Jeff Bonner, Ryan Jarrell, Pat Daly, Patrick Kennedy, Troy Wallet, Mike Camerate, Nicole Harkin, Tim Youssef, Scott Reed. Thanks all of you for supporting Cool Tools. And if you would like to have a shout out, go over to the Patreon page and sign up. And thanks for listening to the Cool Tools Podcast. We'll see you next week.